Father, we thank you for this amazing story, Lord, of your majesty and your power and your compassion upon your people, Lord. Father, would you open our ears as we look uh, in more depth at your word right now. Amen. Amen. Well, um, our journey to the promised land. And uh, as you can see this week, we started with the crossing of the Red Sea. And actually, this story starts uh, way back about 400, more than 400 years uh, before this, um, when uh, God meets Abraham, uh, then called Abraham, and says, then the Lord appeared to Abraham and said to your offspring, I will give this land. That means to his children, to his children's children, he will give this land. And so God had promised this land to Abraham. And that's why it's called the promised land. And later on, uh, God uh, gave a dream to Abraham. And during that dream, this is what he said to him. He said, know for certain that for 400 years, your descendants will be strangers in a country not their own, and they will be enslaved and mistreated there. That's Genesis 15 and verse 13. And so this is incredible, actually, that that the uh, captivity in Egypt, the slavery was predicted by by God uh, to Abraham, to Abraham. The word, uh, the number 400 might sound a little bit misleading, but actually if you, you count that from when uh, Ishmael was sent out from Abraham's presence, it's 400 years. Actually, in Egypt, they were about 230, that uh, number of years, a long time they were in Egypt as uh, slaves. Um, but for 400 years, uh, a, 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 they were strangers in a country that, that was not their own. And in that dream, God also said to Abraham, but I will punish the nation they, they serve as slaves, and afterwards they will come out with great possessions. And uh, it was uh, great to hear Joe explaining that story. And one of the, the amazing things was that they came out with great possessions, and that was prophesied uh, 400 years before they came out. Uh, of that captivity. And Exodus 2 is the beginning of the story. And it says this in verse 23. And this reflects what God said to Moses um, uh, at the at the backside of the desert, um, at the burning bush. And, and uh, it says this, it says, during those many days, the king of Egypt died and the people of Israel groaned because of their slavery and cried out for help. Their cry for rescue from slavery came up to God. And I want to make really the same point here. This is all about prayer and compassion. During those many days, the king of Egypt died and the people of Israel groaned. Have you ever groaned from the strain of life? I really have. Uh, I had a business for uh, 25 years plus, and a lot of that time was groaning. But I would have to say that when my groaning turned into a cry, I got God's attention. Sometimes we're just suffering the strain of something, and we don't even think to lift up our voice to God. But when that groan became a cry, it says that their cry for rescue from slavery came up to God. And then it says God heard their groaning. How amazing. You know that God sees our pain. Joe made this point as well. Further on, verse 25, it says God saw the people of Israel and God knew. How amazing that God knows what we are going through. He understands our pain. He knows everything in absolute detail and he is compassionate so god heard their groaning and then an interesting phrase comes here god remembered his covenant so this thing that god had spoken to abraham 400 years before this covenant this strong agreement that god had made with abraham god was fulfilling as their cry rose up to him what an encouragement to take those two parts of prayer. Number one, let our requests be made known to God. Number two, remember or remind God 
of his covenant because God answers our prayer because he wants to keep his word as well as uh, for reasons that, that he loves us. Do you remember George Muller, uh, who we, uh, uh, Joe took us through the story at the beginning of last year, uh, incredible answers to prayer, incredible answers to prayer. And in his teaching on prayer, his third condition for answered prayer, this is probably going to make you want to look up what all his conditions were. But condition number three was this, faith in God's word of promise. So when we pray, we have to go back to God's word. We have to find the promises and we take them back to God in prayer. And he is faithful to keep his word. So in answer to uh, that cry uh, from the children of Israel, what did God do? He did what he pretty much always did in these ancient times. He sent a savior. And the savior at this time was Moses. God sent a savior. Now, Moses was a type of Jesus. And that word type uh, seems a a funny, maybe theological word, but I I want to explain this to you because this word is going to be very important as we uh, look at this story, uh, as we go through this journey through the wilderness, because we find all sorts of types, all these things. Moses was a type of Jesus. What is a type? Well, a type is a foreshadowing. It's like an an event. This is the definition of it, an event, person, or statement in the Old Testament that prefigures something ahead in the New Testament. So the New Testament reality is called the antitype. So in this case, Moses was the type. Jesus was the antitype. It says it's a foreshadowing, and the Bible talks about these Old Testament stuff through these Old Testament pictures called types. The word type in, uh, comes from the Greek word tupos or typos, and it means a blow, a hitting, a, um, a stamp. And so they used to stamp the impression of people, like the emperor. There's a picture of a coin here. Now, the, uh, the, the, the stamp was only a, an impression. It wasn't the real thing, but it pointed towards the real person. And as we go through these stories, we'll be looking at all sorts of types. For example, in 1 Corinthians 10, verse 3, it says this. And it's describing the journey through the wilderness to the promised land. And all ate the same spiritual food and all drank the same spiritual drink. For they drank from the spiritual rock that followed them. And that rock, the antitype, was Christ. So Jesus was the spiritual food. He was the manna. He was the bread of life. The water pointed to the water that they, the, the, of the Holy Spirit that is given us to drink. And the spiritual rock that followed them through the wilderness, that rock was Christ. Going back to this particular type of Moses going through the Red Sea. And what an amazing and powerful story it was. Time and again, you'll find people uh, in the Old Testament going back and mentioning this extraordinary thing that happened that day and how wonderful that the children are going to be learning uh, this uh, that, that psalm about this crossing of the Red Sea. 1 Corinthians 10 um, verse 1 says this, For I do not want you to be unaware, brothers, that our fathers were all under the cloud, and all passed through the sea, and all, now this is unusual, were baptized into Moses in the cloud and in the sea. So the actual going through the the, the Red Sea was like a type of being baptized into Christ. They were baptized to Moses in the cloud. I suppose that's a reference to where the Bible says uh, you will be baptized in the Holy Spirit not many days from now. 
Um, I haven't got time to go into uh, what the baptism in the Holy Spirit is, but uh, John the Baptist said he will baptize you in the Holy Spirit. So there is uh, th there is something in our experience, there is a drenching, there is a filling, there is an empowering of the Holy Spirit that is in this story, in Christ, in that crossing of the Red Sea. And then they were baptized uh, in water, weren't they? So what happened when that water came down? It separated them from Egypt and it separated them from Pharaoh. Romans 6 verse 3 says this. We were buried, therefore, with him by baptism into death. And there's a picture here of our old nature actually dying in that sea. We were buried with him through baptism. And what was the purpose? That as Christ was raised from the dead, as we come through the other side, by the glory of the Father, we might walk in newness of life. And that was God's expectation, that they would walk in something new. So they'd walked out of Egypt into, no, not Israel yet, that was a bit further away, but they'd come out of Egypt. Colossians 1.13 says this, he has delivered us, that's you and me, from the domain, and the Greek word means the authority of darkness, and he has transferred us like from one nation to another, to the kingdom of his beloved son. So we've been transferred out of of the authority of darkness, and we have been brought into the kingdom of his son, where we are now under the authority of Jesus. That's a good promise to get hold of. And Hebrews 2.15 says that through death, he might destroy the one who has the power of death. That is the devil. And the Pharaoh was a picture of Satan. He was a picture of the prince of this world. And his power came to an end that day when he and his chariots were, went uh, into those waters. But I want to um, just mention really a very sobering and a very sad and a very important fact. It could have taken just 40 days to get Israel out of Egypt and into the promised land. And as somebody has once said, but it took 40 years to get Egypt out of Israel. And you can see on the illustration here on the map here that on the, the left hand side, um, they, they're crossing that water, the Red Sea. And then they went into the wilderness and then they tried to get into the promised land. But it all went Pete Tong, as they say, it all went wrong. And when they got there, the spies went into the land and they, they, they came back with these incredible uh, uh, grapes and the milk and the honey and everything. And this is an amazing, a wonderful land. But there are giants in this land and we can't do it. Numbers 13 verse 33 says this, we seem to ourselves like grasshoppers and so we seem to them. And because they seemed so small and unable and they didn't know God, they didn't believe in him, they could not enter the land. So God said, you're going to be go in the wilderness and you're not going to go into the promised land. And they were distraught. So they went straight back the next day, had a go and got completely destroyed by the armies in that land. And so something had to happen. They were not ready to go in. And the first thing that the first uh, reason for this was that they had been slaves for 400 years. Well, let's just say 230 years they'd actually been in Egypt under that subjection of slavery. But can you imagine that's that's uh, that's a number of, of generations. They couldn't have remembered what it was like before them. But they had always been in subjection in slavery. And they had that mentality of Egypt. They were always pining to go back to Egypt. They wanted the garlics. They wanted the leeks. They wanted the, what they thought were luxuries. They weren't really luxuries, but that's what they knew. And they wanted to go back. A second reason that they couldn't go in was that they didn't know the Lord. They could not have conquered the Canaanites and the Hittites and the Amorites and the Perizzites. They would have been destroyed because they did not know the Lord. It says that Pharaoh did not know the Lord, but they didn't either. So they, God gave them the Ten Commandments. 
He gave them instructions. He gave them the tabernacle. He gave them the pillar of fire. He gave them the cloud. He gave them the water. He gave them the manna. He gave them miracles. He kept them supernaturally for 40 years until they knew the Lord. At least one generation did. And thirdly, because they were full of sin. And I believe as we go through these these 10 weeks together, let's let, 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 let God deal with our hearts. 1 Corinthians 10, it goes on, it says, now these things took place as examples for us, that we might not desire evil as they did. Are you like me? You desire evil. Even though you know it's wrong, even though you know that the outcome will be bad, you are still tempted to do evil. And they were the same. And they were examples to us. And then it says, nevertheless, with most of them, God was not pleased, for they were overthrown in the wilderness. In other words, they died. They had to die. And that's a picture that these things, if we're going to serve God and be useful to him, we have to bring these Egyptian things into subjection. These are just a few of the things that they were into. Complaining. Oh, how they complained. At every corner they complained. And they blamed. You know, those two things go together. When things are going badly, we look for other people to blame. They were idolatrous. The golden calf story. The, they were lustful. The playing with the other women, as it describes it, um, uh, at that golden calf incident. They were greedy. They were selfish. They were impatient. They were jealous of Moses and Aaron's gifts. Maybe most of all, they were unbelieving because they didn't know God. So what happened? The old generation all died, every one of them in the wilderness, except for Joshua and Caleb. And they were the ones who knew God and they wanted to go in in the first place. But everything else had to die. If we want to be useful to God, we're going to have to let sin die in our lives with God's help. It's a challenge. And then the memory of Egypt had no more power on the new generation. There was a new generation during those 40 years that were born. The teenagers um, that came out that were not men of war, that hadn't gone as spies into the land, they would have been too young. But that new generation, what did they know? They didn't know Egypt. They knew the Lord. They knew his provision. This new generation knew God and they knew his word and they were ready to go in. I want to finish this morning by asking you a question or some questions. First of all, I'm going to let Joshua ask you a question. Joshua 18 verse 3 says this. So Joshua said to the people of Israel, and listen to this question. Think how it applies to you. It's a type. It's a picture. How long will you put off going in to take possession of the land. Now, what is this possessing the land? I want you to think over these weeks. What is possessing the land? What is the land of promise that I have to possess? I believe it's the life of Jesus. It's a life of victory. It's a life of, of God doing in our lives the thing he planned to do. It's letting him fulfill his purpose individually for our lives and for us as a church. And as we come out of this pandemic, I believe God's got a new mission for us as a church, which the Lord, it says, the God of your fathers has given you. Here's a picture of the promised land. And it was it was split up between the tribes. It's also individual. What is your gift? What is God's plan for your life? That's a big question. Will I take possession of it? Will I let God get Egypt out of me? I'm going to finish there. I'm going to pray. And then in a moment, we're going to sing that beautiful song, uh, Turn Your Eyes Upon Jesus. Because he's the only one that could do this. He took them out. He brought them in. But they had to let him take them through. So let's pray. Father, we thank you. For the promised land. We thank you, Jesus, for the blood of Passover. Thank you that you purchased their freedom with your own blood, Lord. Thank you for the commandments that you gave them, the provision in the wilderness. You gave them everything that they would need. 
And Father, we pray that we would learn over these weeks to let you provide for us, to let you lead us, and that you would give us obedient hearts. And Father, would you show us what is your plan for our life? What's that thing you want us to do? What is the thing you want us to do at New Life as your church? Father, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.